This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. You've seen the headlines. Late last year, international scientists warned global warming is on track to raise Earth's temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next 12 years. The consequences would be dramatic, including widespread drought and extreme heat that will impact the lives of hundreds of millions of people. So you may be wondering, what can one individual do to affect climate change? A Canadian researcher will join us to talk about four key ways we can reduce our carbon footprint. Are they easy to follow? Depends on who you ask. We'll also get an update on plans in Connecticut to invest in renewable energy. Will wind power projects have potential here in Massachusetts? Like it it does in Massachusetts, rather. We're going to find out. First, our state has joined with eight other states in the Northeast and Washington, D.C., in an initiative to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. How do they plan to do it? For more, joining us from a studio at WGBH is David Abel, an environmental reporter for the Boston Globe. David is also a filmmaker. David, tell us again the title of your new film. Lobster War, the fight over the world's richest fishing grounds. So maybe we can get into that uh, with you in the future. Uh, It's it's definitely a topic that's uh, interesting to our New England listeners. But let's talk uh, first, David, about this uh, new regional agreement to combat uh, climate change. Um, It's going to focus in on the transportation sector. Tell us about it. Sure. Uh, This is a landmark agreement that echoes a similar agreement that uh, uh, nine other states in the region have for power plant emissions. And the goal here is to try to cap and and basically invest the uh, proceeds of this collective um, that would impose essentially a tax on transportation emissions. Basically, it would require that fuel distributors uh, pay a um, a certain amount for uh, the pollution that they produce and that the proceeds from those pollution permits that they would have to buy would be invested in all sorts of uh, transportation infrastructure, whether that would be um, that could that could include uh, electric car charging stations, new bike line bike lanes, public transportation. The states would have, Each state would have the ability to choose how they would invest the money, but it would have to be transportation related. And this is considered vital because transportation emissions now are the largest source of carbon emissions in the United States and in this region. They now account for uh, roughly 40 percent of uh, carbon emissions throughout the Northeast. And this is considered the primary um, uh, challenge for trying to reduce our overall carbon footprint. So you were talking a little bit about the mechanism for cap and invest. Uh, Why is this coalition coming together now, David? Well, they have uh, been talking for several years about trying to figure out uh, a a bunch of states uh, throughout the region uh, have been trying to figure out a way to deal with what is uh, the biggest um, uh, fruit, let's say, hanging uh, on the vine here for trying to um, trying to put us in a better place, especially as the federal government has um, has essentially um, stopped trying to cut carbon emissions. There's just a report today that in the United States uh, last year, carbon emissions increased for the first time in the last few years by three and a half percent. That spike is considered very concerning. And right now, it's the states that are really trying to find a means of addressing our carbon emissions uh, and living up to our um, commitments uh, made under the previous administration to reduce our carbon emissions uh, by more than a quarter below uh, 2005 levels. And if this really comes to pass, these states have about a year to try to figure out a system that they can all agree on to try to reduce their transportation emissions. And if that comes to pass, it could make a serious dent in the United States overall carbon emissions, because when you put all of these states together, there are eight states that have already signed on to the agreement or the um, or the framework for an agreement, really, uh, as well as Washington, D.C. And it's believe that New York and Maine um, and um, and possibly uh, some other states will 
join in as well over the coming year. Um, but if all of these states together make a serious dent in reducing their transportation emissions, that could have an, a, a significant uh, benefit overall for our country's commitments under the Paris Climate Accord, whether we're in it or not, uh, to actually reduce uh, our overall emissions. David Abels uh, with us from the studios at WGBH in Boston, environmental reporter for the Boston Globe. He just referenced a story out of the Washington Post. It was reported uh, early this morning, uh, research from the independent economic firm Rhodium Group, uh, again showing that U.S. greenhouse gas emissions spiked in the last year. We'll tweet out a link uh, at where we live. So tell us a little bit more about how this will uh, trickle down to uh, actual drivers in our region, uh, David, uh, by putting uh, this type of tax on um, gas companies and, and such, you know, how will that impact uh, our habits and costs for uh, taxpayers? Well, it, it's a great question, and it's hard to say at the moment because the details have to be worked out. And so we don't know exactly uh, how the system would work. If it works similar to the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or uh, what's commonly referred to as REGI, which requires that power plant companies pay a certain um, pollution tax, if you if you will, um, it would require it would put it would require fuel distributors, the companies that sell diesel and gasoline to gas stations and other um, and other distributors um, to pay a similar kind of pollution uh, permit. Now, Presumably, they will pass on some of those costs to um, to the gas stations, and the gas stations would presumably pass them on to drivers. One group um, has come up with an estimate that they say uh, that they say would mean an average uh, of six dollars, I believe, a month uh, in additional costs for drivers um, in the region. Um, it's unclear exactly you know, what those numbers will ultimately come out to. But on the flip side, that same group suggests that there could be, in just my state, Massachusetts, uh, a, an increase in funds uh, of something like $5.5 billion dollars uh, through 2030 for transportation initiatives. And that money could go a long way to addressing our needs here for uh, fixing all the problems that we have in our public transportation system in the Boston metropolitan area and really um, providing, uh, solving the chicken and egg problem of electric car, uh, of electric cars, which is, you know, how do you Get, encourage people to buy electric cars when there might not be enough charging stations. And if we get past that, that will lay the groundwork for potentially a revolution in the way people drive. And that could um, ultimately reduce costs uh, rather than raise them. Has there been any uh, pushback from uh, citizens in these particular states? I know this announcement came around the holidays, so it might be the first time listeners are hearing about this uh, coalition that Connecticut, Massachusetts, and others have joined, uh, again, to look at ways to cut carbon emissions from the transportation sector. But anytime uh, consumers often hear that they might be paying a little bit more, there is some pushback. But what is, uh, I guess, public sentiment about what, how this money could be used for the greater good? Well, uh, some of the states that belong to the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative have not signed on to this, uh, and uh, two in particular, Maine and New Hampshire, which are led by Republican governors who have taken, uh, who, who have raised concerns about additional taxes and potential costs to uh, to to their residents, and uh, that might explain why they have not decided to participate at this point. Um, that said, there are others on the other side of the spectrum uh, who are concerned that having some kind of regional system uh, that would be hard for their own lawmakers to uh, govern uh, and really require some kind of accountability uh, 
um, they worry that, let's say, in a progressive uh, left leaning state like Massachusetts, it might, they argue, inhibit our carbon emissions reductions by making it so that our um, policies are less progressive and that we're sort of just uh, following what we can get other states to agree to and following some policy that would be a compromise rather than leading them through uh, our own uh, carbon tax that could be far uh, more uh, effective, at least some folks say. Uh, David, you uh, earlier um, mentioned REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Again, uh, this was uh, looking at ways to cap power plant carbon emissions in particip- participating states, including uh, many in New England, uh, such as Connecticut and Massachusetts, Connecticut being a founding member. How well has that go- gone over the last decade? Uh, by most accounts, it has gone uh, quite well. And I believe uh, since REGI took effect in um, about a decade ago, uh, we have seen a decline uh, of something like forty uh, percent in our emissions. Let me uh, let me just verify that. Uh, but there has been uh, there there have been um, twin factors here. We've also experienced a revolution in the way um, our power plants work and our and our uh, and how we get power. And that is, we've seen a transition, substantial transition from coal and oil to natural gas uh, over the past decade, as the price of natural gas has declined substantially as the result of new technology like hydraulic fracking. And that change um, has coincided with the REGI um, system. And that it's it's not 100% clear to anyone uh, wh- whether it's the Reggie system that is responsible or just the market factors that have reduced the amount of the worst uh, carbon-intensive uh, fuels that are used, uh, such as power, such as coal and, and oil. Um, but uh, there have also been a significant amount of revenues that have gone to each state and those states have been using them for all kinds of things and um, and one of the things that have, it, the proceeds of Reggie have been used for at least in my state Massachusetts have been energy efficiency and that has uh, really helped uh, reduce carbon emissions. Uh, we got a, a tweet from a, a listener or a comment on Facebook uh, who writes that it's interesting that Connecticut and other states are talking about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but still building standalone parking garages with uh, their uh, money. So I guess there is that uh, that uh, conversation to be had about, uh, you know, on one end, uh, this is a, a good priority and initiative to follow, but are, are states thinking uh, smartly uh, within their own borders and trying to get people off the roads? Well, there are a whole suite of policies that states have been uh, looking at to try to do that. And uh, in uh, Massachusetts, uh, Governor Baker just announced a um, just released a report about our future transportation needs. And uh, there are a whole a whole uh, list of potential options on the table for what we could be doing. Uh, to change our transportation system, and that could include uh, congestion pricing in uh, in cities, uh, like exist in uh, in some cities in Europe, uh, where there would be a major tax uh, for or toll uh, for coming into this for driving into the city, uh, with the idea of encouraging fewer people to drive and more people to take public transportation. So uh, imposing uh, taxes on uh, pollution is just one of an array of options to try to change our transportation sector and ultimately reduce emissions.
Before we head to break, uh, David Abel, again, uh, environmental reporter for the Boston Globe. We've been talking about commitments uh, in the Northeast, but can we look to places like uh, Canada, where they've seen success in carbon pricing and how they're reinvesting the, that money uh, in into their economy and also uh, into more uh, clean energy? Absolutely. So this uh, uh, would not be the first of its kind. There is currently a pact between California and Quebec uh, that uh, that redu- to reduce transportation as well as power plant emissions and some other emissions. Uh, but a tally by the California Air Resources Board last month uh, found that that program has raised nearly $10 billion since it took effect in 2012. And, uh, and the hope is that, it, uh, that, that if a similar transportation emissions program uh, exists throughout the Northeast in at least the eight states and Washington, D.C. that have already signed up for uh, some kind of system that they will resolve within the next year, that that could produce uh, far more than that. Uh, we're talking about tens of billions of dollars over the next uh, decade that they could use to try to uh, substantially change their transportation system and reduce emissions. David Abel, again, is joining us from the studios at WGBH in Boston. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. David's an environmental reporter for the Boston Globe. As we learned a little bit about uh, this new initiative um, from uh, nine states and uh, Washington, D.C., to look at ways to cut carbon emissions from the transportation sector. Uh, Coming up, we're going to continue our conversation, and we're going to learn more and focus more on other ways Connecticut and New England states are working to reduce carbon emissions, including investments in renewable energy. You can join us too, 860-275-7266. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, what can you do to reduce your carbon footprint? You may rattle off things like recycle more or drive an electric car, but Canadian researchers say those options actually have a low impact. We'll find out what they say can make a real difference. That's later. Now, on the phone, oh, actually joining us from a studio at WGBH in Boston is David Abel, who's an environmental reporter for the Boston Globe. As we uh, learned about how Connecticut and other Northeast states are uh, talking about ways to uh, decrease uh, carbon emissions. Uh, in uh, the Northeast. Now, that new initiative uh, looks to cap and reduce emissions from transportation fuels, but states are also investing more in renewable energy. To get more about the Connecticut focus, joining us in studio is Emily Lewis, who's senior policy analyst for the Acadia Center in Hartford, and she focuses on offshore wind and the electrification of buildings and transportation. To get that right, Emily? That's right. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Welcome to our show. Thanks. So we were talking a little bit about uh, these agreements between Connecticut and other states, and uh, we asked uh, David earlier about the Reggie Agreement, and I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about um, some of the what we've seen here in Connecticut uh, since uh, they signed on, one of the founding members, onto this agreement uh, to cap emissions. Yeah, it's been wildly connect- uh <laughs> Wildly successful in Connecticut as well as Massachusetts. Uh, In Connecticut, uh, like David mentioned for Massachusetts, we spend a lot of that money on energy efficiency programs. um, And and we've been able to uh, reduce our energy consumption over time because of that program. And we're also reducing emissions because of that program. Um, We're helping people save money on their electricity bills because they consume less electricity as a result of reducing their energy consumption. Can you explain for our listeners who may not be familiar with REGI um, how it it really works? So uh, polluters are are paying more uh, to pollute, and then that money is being reinvested in clean energy? Right. So REGI offers what are called allowances, which is basically the permission to emit CO2. And so they, they... set a set number of allowances every cycle, uh, and then every cycle they reduce the number of allowances over time. So it, it forces the, it gives fewer options for polluting over time. And so that ratchets down emission. And by selling all of those allowances, um, they raise a lot of money. And so that money is distributed to all the states that participate in the program. Uh, and then Connecticut gets their share of, of those revenues as a participant. Now, we should say uh, there was a lot of flack that politicians in Connecticut got over the last uh, year and a half because some of that money was actually raided. Can you talk a little bit about has some of that gone, um, has that uh, um, amount that the lawmakers have taken, um, has that, is that still going to be an issue this coming session? Is that something you worry about? It, it is something we worry about. I mean, I, I, there, 
they rated the 2018 and 2019 funds. 2018 is pretty much passed uh, in terms of those revenues. 2019, there's a potential for some of those monies to be refunded to the programs. But yes, that was a it was a big hit to the programs and the number of customers they're able to serve and the number you know the amount of energy they're able to reduce through those programs because of that raid. Uh, when you look at Connecticut, the state's still heavily invested in natural gas. So uh, when we think about um, how other states in New England, uh, such as Massachusetts and Rhode Island, are investing in renewable energy, uh, still a lot of room for Connecticut to grow. Can you kind of uh, give us a timeline of how we got here um, <laughs> in terms of our natural gas uh, infrastructure and how that's grown? But what's next? Right. I mean, through through Reggie, Reggie has sort of caused the shift to natural gas from dirtier polluters like like coal. Um, but we sort of maxed out our capacity to add natural gas because there's so little coal uh, in the region now. So we really need to be looking towards the next thing, which is renewables. Um, offshore wind is going to be a huge opportunity for Connecticut. We're, we're dabbling in offshore wind. We're starting to invest. Um, but we need, really need to catch up to our neighbors like Massachusetts and Rhode Island in terms of the amount of offshore wind we're trying to add to our our state's uh, energy portfolio. Uh, we also uh, get uh, energy from uh, Millstone in Connecticut. So can we talk about um, how nuclear energy, is that something that we will be relying on less and less? Uh, Millstone uh, has a, an operating license that's offered through the federal government. And that operating license that has two. The first one expires in 2035 and the second one in 2045. So those are sort of the end dates for that plant. Um, we're going to need to make a transition plan for what we're going to do when that plant goes offline. And so, you know, it, you can't just turn on plants uh, and have them operating, uh, you know, at the snap of your fingers. You need to plan for that. So we need to be planning now and adding renewable resources to the grid so that we're ready for that eventuality. And when we look at the legislative session, uh, there was a bill uh, to increase requirements of Connecticut's renewable energy portfolio. So can you uh, tell us a little bit about why that that goal uh, of uh, getting it to 40 percent by 2030? Is that actually attainable? It's definitely attainable. Yes. I mean, we're, we're on the path. And, and by setting these uh, requirements, you, you give the certainty to developers that Connecticut is actually going to look for this energy. So it encourages more people to build. Uh, and, and it's been driving the, the transition to renewable energy that we've seen today. Also part of adding renewables to the state's portfolio are things like procurement. So this is something where you're doing a direct contract between a utility and a developer for that energy, which is what's driving a lot of the offshore wind development today, because that market is much newer than some of the more uh, established energy technologies. Emily Lewis is in the studio with me. She's senior policy analyst for the Acadia Center in Hartford. Joining us from the studio at WGBH in Boston is David Abel, environmental reporter for the Boston Globe. Uh, since we're talking about offshore wind, David, can you talk about um, the what's been happening in off of Massachusetts, rather, with several wind projects there? Sure. Um, so uh, the first thing I'd just say is just to go back to what you were uh, asking earlier about nuclear power. As a we we share power throughout New England. Uh, it's a it's a regional grid, and the region will be providing will be receiving less nuclear power, um, and has steadily been receiving less nuclear power, and that is putting uh, more of an onus on the states to find other kinds of renewable energy. In uh, June of this year, the uh, Pilgrim Power Plant, which provides more than 800 megawatts of uh, of zero emissions, or it depends on how you uh, look at it, but mainly zero emissions um, energy is going offline. And that is uh, going to be replaced, hopefully, by renewable energy. And that uh, renewable energy will hopefully include offshore wind. And currently, there is a project that is in the permitting phase and uh, in the design phase and is supposed to break ground uh, by the end of this year uh, to put some 800 megawatts worth of offshore wind south of Martha's Vineyard. Um, that will be a landmark uh, effort. Uh, we currently have off of the coast of Rhode Island a, a small, relatively um, uh, modest project that was the first, the nation's first offshore wind uh, project that's off of Block Island, and that's just 30 megawatts of power that's being produced there. Uh, so the project, if it actually gets done, and there are some concerns about the impact on fishermen and all kinds of uh, debates and controversy that's roiling uh, this project at the moment uh, about uh, 
uh, how it's been uh, how how it's been planned and where the turbines would go and how that would affect lobstermen and other kinds of fishermen. Um, and there are some concerns that it could be that it could be stopped uh, because this project is dependent on tax credits that expire at the end of 2019. That said, uh, the state of Massachusetts has this ambitious plan to bring on uh, by the end of 2027 some 1,600 megawatts of offshore wind and. Several states in the region have um, even more ambitious plans. Uh, New York has called for 2,400 uh, megawatts of offshore wind, and New Jersey has called for 3,500 megawatts of offshore wind, both uh, by 2030. So we are looking at uh, what could very well be a massive effort to uh, change our, how our grid produces power uh, over the coming decade. Emily, I'll go back to you. Uh, when we hear David talk about Massachusetts and other states, uh, they have better locations to site offshore wind than Connecticut. So uh, tell us about um, where we would procure from, from them then. Right. That, so Connecticut would actually procure offshore wind from the same area that they're building it in Massachusetts. So it's those federal waters way out. Uh, you can't see them from shore um, between sort of Montauk and Martha's Vineyard area. Um, a lot of people think when they hear offshore wind for Connecticut that there's going to be turbines in the sound and this is going to be a terrible thing. That's not the case. (laughs) They will be way far out to sea. Um, And yeah, so because it's a regional grid, like David mentioned, you can import that power into New England and then Connecticut essentially buys the credits for the zero emission attributes of those wind turbines. But from the Acadia Center's standpoint, I mean, the state doesn't really invest as much as they should compared to other states. Explain uh, what the investment is in this uh, this last cycle compared to, say, Massachusetts or Rhode Island. Right. So Connecticut uh, recently signed a contract for 200 megawatts of offshore wind, and then recently they added another 100 megawatts onto that project for a total of 300 megawatts. Uh, David just rattled off the list of other states. So Massachusetts, again, 1,600 megawatt commitment. Uh, Rhode Island is building 400 megawatts, uh, and New York and New Jersey have their large commitments as well. Connecticut actually doesn't have a mandate on the book. So they're sort of doing these piecemeal smaller procurements, which is great. They're small steps the the state should be taking, but uh, really we need something ambitious, like a 200 megawatt commitment by 2030, something along those lines uh, on the book so that the state has a sort of marching path for what they're really targeting. Uh, I know our environmental reporter here at WMPR is uh, reporting uh, the latest on looking at New London as a po- possible manufacturing hub for wind farm related, uh, again, uh, parts. So can you talk a little bit about that? Right. So it's it's there's a whole supply chain in- involved in making a wind turbine from the, the blades to the mechanical, you know, turbines, the nacelles inside of the, the, the turbines themselves, and then there's the structures that you put them on and, and building them out in the sea. So there's a lot of jobs that could be created uh, just in the building of the turbines. Uh, and then all of these industries that make the parts could be set up there as well. And because New London has a really great deep water port, they don't have overhead restrictions on the port. Uh, they've actually been sort of talking to the offshore wind developers, uh, and, t- and they've also received um, commitments from one of them uh, on the order of $20 million between the two commitments to re- rehabilitate that port and create the, create the environment for building these turbines there. You're listening to Where We Live in studio with me, Emily Lewis, Senior Policy Analyst for the Acadia Center in Hartford, and joining us from WGBH, David Abel, Environmental Reporter for the Boston Globe, as we look at how uh, states in New England are uh, investing in renewable uh, energy and the fact that Connecticut does lag behind uh, some of our New England neighbors. I don't want solar to get lost in the conversation, so can we talk about uh, what's happening within our state, uh, Emily? Sure. So uh, in terms of distributed solar, Connecticut lags its neighbors a little bit, uh, quite a bit, actually. Um, and and one of the, the challenges the state now faces is instead of putting in place policies to really accelerate the deployment of solar, uh, it, it's actually put in place at the end of 2018 some policies that would hinder uh, development of solar going forward in terms of the way people are incentivized for putting it on their, on their roofs. Um, so that uh, is a place where Connecticut really needs to dig in in 2019 to, to look at some new policies to move the technology forward in the state. And the federal government incentivizing solar, that has uh, been reduced significantly? 
Right. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head what the policy change was there. But yeah, the federal government has been ramping down its tax credits over time. I was seeing uh, within one of the reports uh, that we were reading that Connecticut really lags behind states like uh, Vermont when it comes to rooftop solar. So when we think about Vermont, they're finding ways to incentivize uh, consumers to, to have solar? Right. Vermont and Massachusetts, Connecticut lags behind. They, they have policies. Um, one of the policies that incentivizes solar in the state is net metering, which is the ability for a solar customer to uh, first consume any energy that their p- panels are generating, and then they s- essentially sell it back to the grid uh, at the retail rate. So they, the amount they're selling to the grid is basically credited from their bill at the retail rate. Um, Connecticut has changed that policy at the end of 2018, and they're still figuring out the details of what exactly this is going to look like. But instead of first the solar energy coming to your house, they're saying all the solar energy goes directly from your panels into the grid. Uh, And then so you're selling everything you generate to the grid and then you're buying everything back. And so if you're credited at less than the retail rate for what you're selling, uh, it it, it disincentivizes you to put that solar on the roof because you become a little power generator and you're not um, receiving that power for yourself right off the bat. Um, So in in terms of a state where we're trying to really ramp up what what we want to do for solar, this is not the type of policy that would really incentivize that going forward. Uh, David Abel, uh, you're with us again from WGBH in Boston, our uh, environment reporter for the Boston Globe. Uh, we were focusing in on Connecticut, but when we compare, uh, when we hear about your state of Massachusetts, your state also heavily invested in natural gas? Uh, yes, very much so. And there have been uh, lots of calls to increase uh, the power line, the um, Uh, pipelines that bring in natural gas into our state and the region, uh, especially given that this time of year, there are uh, heavy demands for natural gas, which heat most of the homes here. And the uh, concern is that when you don't have enough of it, you have to rely on more emissions intensive fuels like oil uh, and to uh, almost uh, to to a a much lesser extent now coal. And um, and that is incredibly controversial here because the concern is that if you build all of these new pipelines, uh, th- there will be a, a demand for natural gas uh, for decades to come and uh, a need to pay off the um, the costs of building those pipelines as opposed to investing uh, more in offshore wind and uh, other kinds of renewables. And I should say that um, what we're seeing uh, over the coming, uh, what what we're seeing now, um, and likely in the coming years, is that the market will overtake these uh, requirements that the states or commitments that the states are making to uh, generate more interest in renewables. So just uh, a few weeks ago, um, the three developers, there was a federal auction for um, uh, leasing areas off of Mar- between Martha's Vineyard and Montauk, let's say, uh, this massive area that's considered the Saudi Arabia for wind uh, in the United States that just um, saw a record for three developers pay a record $405 million to gain access to some 390,000 acres of federal waters. And um, that demonstrates that that these these companies believe that this is the future and it doesn't depend on tax credits it doesn't depend on state uh requirements that utilities buy this kind of renewable energy it suggests that there is a a significant market and that these companies believe that they will make uh, a considerable amount of money from uh, such investments. Emily, your your take on what David was saying? Um, I mean, it's it's great that the federal government offered up these lease sales. I think it shows that the market is maturing, that they had so many great bidders with such high bids. And, and I, I totally agree with David that it's showing that uh, we don't need the tax credits to move forward. This is going to be the future of, of energy in the region. Um, and uh, I like the analogy of, you know, this is the Northeast being at the top of the pipeline rather than the bottom of the pipeline. Usually we're bringing in natural gas and oil from other regions. This is our... Uh, natural gas, if you will. <laughs> uh, Beth's been holding, uh, I should say Ben's been holding from Wallingford. Ben, what's your question or comment? Um, so I just want to say, like, everything that the panelists are talking about is positive, um, but it doesn't match the scale of the climate change problem. Um, and the best plan so far that has 
talked about things that can be done to match the scale is the Green New Deal. And this can not only be implemented um, nationally, but can be implemented on a, by a statewide by, you know, um, basically stopping, allowing things like the Title V permits for pipelines and power plants that pollute. And I just want to say an organization I volunteer for, 350 Connecticut, is going to the inauguration of Ned Lamont tomorrow to convince him that this is a good idea to do and his administration to do it. Um, so just things like not building any more power plants, incentivizing solar, as they talked about, but also having the government build its own solar stuff and make the government buildings required to have renewable energy versus pollution. Uh, ben, uh, your point is well taken. I'll go back to Emily Lewis uh, because I, I did want to ask you uh, from the perspective of Acadia a Center in Hartford, um, with this uh, new administration, you know, what are some priorities that you would like to see uh, move forward? I mean, I think we've talked about two of them already, um, setting that offshore wind mandate for the state so that we know where we're going. We know that we're going to procure that really great energy for Connecticut that we have locally uh, and create those jobs that come along with it. So I uh, the caller mentioned uh, the the Green New Deal. Offshore wind is definitely part of that picture. Uh, changing the rules around uh, rooftop solar, I think, is also really important and, and does fit into that Green New Deal uh, idea as well because you're creating uh, local jobs in state for those panels to be installed. So those are two uh, policies that we really need to move forward in the Lamont administration. We also talked about the energy efficiency rate, possibilities for reversing that. Uh, or at the bare minimum, we need to ensure that we have those funds uh, in perpetuity uh, going forward because we can't have another raid like that. It, the energy efficiency industry supports over 30,000 jobs in the state. So when we're raiding those funds, uh, that is in direct combat with this idea of the, the Green New Deal. Um, but, uh, you know, the caller also mentioned the good point of thinking about natural gas. And he's right that every time you build a new plant, you know, they're online for, you know, indefinitely, really. I think they, they give them a, an operating life of 30 years, but they always stay on longer than that. And so that's pollution that you've locked in for that amount of time. Um, so thinking about how we need to start moving towards uh, s stopping building those plants, basically, and, and moving towards more renewables. Emily Lewis, again, is senior policy analyst for the Acadia Center in Hartford. Uh, she focuses on offshore wind and the electrification of buildings and transportation. Emily, thanks for coming in. We appreciate your perspective. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Also with us today was David Abel, environmental reporter for the Boston Globe. He's a filmmaker, has a new film out, Lobster War, the fight over the world's richest fishing grounds. We'll have to have you back, David. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, what personal choices can each one of us make to effectively uh, slow down climate change? A Canadian scientist will join us, or researcher rather, will join us after the break to talk about the real ways to reduce our carbon footprint. You may be surprised, and you can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. A growing number of Americans say climate change is a threat. A Reuters poll in late December found nearly 7 out of 10 people want to see the U.S. work with other nations to address the issue. But the Trump administration still plans on withdrawing from the Paris Climate Agreement by 2020. So what can individuals do to lessen their carbon footprint in the most effective ways? Well, joining us now by phone is Seth Wines, Ph.D. candidate at University of British Columbia who studies climate change mitigation. Seth, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so we were talking about uh, ways uh, states are looking at reducing carbon emissions, and but you and some other researchers focused in on uh, individual contributions to fighting climate change. Uh, first, what made you uh, look specifically at this report, and how did you measure some of the ways uh, that people are, uh, you know, trying to think smarter about the environment, but it's not exactly as effective as they they, they once thought. Yeah, so I was a high school science teacher before I went to grad school, and I talked to a lot of students who wanted to know what they could do about climate change, and I didn't have the best answers. So I wanted to go out and find those answers and answer the question, are we talking about the most effective actions? And that's what spurred me to write that report. So I looked at a whole bunch of different studies and then tried to take the numbers that they made in those studies and make fair comparisons between them, put them in the same terms, so they were apples to apples, and determine, okay, what are the most effective actions? 
Uh, we mentioned the Paris Climate Accord, uh, and scientists uh, worry that uh, we won't be able to keep our planet from uh, warming, uh, you know, t- uh, more than uh, two degrees Celsius. It's going to be have a real big impact. So when we think about individual, uh, our carbon footprint, um, what are some things that we are doing that are contributing to this problem? Definitely um, the way that we move, transportation contributes a large portion. So people owning, moving with personal vehicles, just it requires a lot of energy, a lot of greenhouse gases. Another thing is the livestock industry produces a lot of methane, which is a very strong greenhouse gas. It contributes um, greater warming per particle than carbon dioxide does even. So that's also a very large source of emissions on our planet. So uh, one of your uh, suggestions is to go car free. That's easier said to do- and than done, depending on where people live, depending on uh, mass transit. Uh, we've also talked about uh, pl- uh, those who choose to have a plant-based diet. But even uh, air travel uh, can be significant. Can you talk us through that, Seth? Yeah, absolutely. It takes a lot of energy to fight against gravity and lift this giant piece of metal into the sky. So when you're thinking about, let's say, a round trip transatlantic flight, that makes 1.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents, getting you there and back. And for a normal person, that's a significant part of your carbon footprint. It could be a tenth of it in um, a single year for the average American. So flying is a big deal, and it's something that we need to consider more fully. Also, uh, your uh, paper looked at um, what happens when families have one fewer child and uh, that impact. Uh, Can you talk through that? Yeah, of course. When you have more people on the planet, they're going to be using more resources. And because our society relies so much on fossil fuels, each additional person is going to be burning and creating more greenhouse gases. And so we tried to quantify what are the added emissions for each additional child so that people who really care about their carbon footprint and are looking at this question of, okay, how big do I want my family to be? Now, that's a very personal decision. There are a lot of things that someone might take into account, but we wanted the numbers there so that they could also think about that if they chose to. I think the comparison in the paper was if you had one fewer child, that would be like 600 high schoolers who recycled comprehensively their entire lives. Yeah, it is a big difference. 684 teenagers recycling for the rest of their lives. I think part of that is because recycling um, is such a popular thing to mention, but it's not that important for climate change. It's important for a lot of other reasons, right? And yet we really fixate on on it and tend to recommend it a lot. Uh, So when we uh, think about what you've told us so far, again, Seth Wines, PhD candidate at University of British Columbia who studies climate change mitigation. So if someone were to take one international trip and continue to eat a meat-based diet, uh, that can take up their whole carbon allowance uh, under this Paris Agreement? Um, it, it can get you pretty close, especially where we're hoping to go. If you're able to, the more reductions that you can make, the better, for sure. And so you you also talk about in your research the importance of talking with uh, adolescents and high schoolers about changes that they can make. Uh, tell us a little bit more about why that's the, the, the ideal demographic to reach out to, Seth. You know, you mentioned how living car-free maybe is easier said than done, depending on where you live. Well, adolescents growing up haven't made a lot of choices that have locked them into high-carbon lifestyles. So if you're 50 years old and you've already chosen to live in the suburbs and you've picked your job and so on, you're right. You might have a difficult time making some of these choices. But if you're a young person who hasn't established these habits you have a great opportunity to set a course for life and choose a low-carbon lifestyle that can be fun, good for your health, and easy to maintain for decades. 
Uh, we, sh- we should note that you're uh, based in, in Canada, and so since your paper came out in 2017, um, you know, part of what you were looking into is how uh, students, uh, the material that's in their textbooks, uh, talking to them about ways uh, to be more environmentally, environmentally conscious, again, uh, those efforts like recycling actually have a, a low impact. And so I'm wondering, you know, has there been a reaction within uh, your country in terms of, of, of ways to educate for more effective ways, Seth? Definitely, you know, I'm still a little connected to the educational community, and I've talked with a lot of teachers who have been using these resources, who have presented them at conferences. I've had the opportunity to share these ideas in classrooms myself, and I've received messages from teachers who have said, oh, you know, I've started bringing that up in my science class. And maybe most exciting, I've talked to some textbook writers who have said, oh, good work. I wish your research had been available when we had written that first textbook. And so I think that as the educational system moves on and updates itself, it'll catch up on this little gap that it had before. And what would you say uh, to people who say, look, I'm only one person. We're talking about, you know, uh, making changes that, you know, could we get hundreds of millions of people uh, uh, to do? Maybe that could have an impact. But what, why should I make these specific changes? You know, great question. A lot of people are sitting there thinking, I'm just a drop in the bucket, but you can be many drops. We can do these sorts of things together. If these changes aren't available, you can work with collective actions, with organizations, by contacting your uh, congressperson and asking for changes to be made, or your city councilor, so that you do have public transit available. Um, You know, Millions of Americans vote for the NBA All-Star Game. They vote for American Idol. So they take time out of their day to do these actions where they're just one out of a million, but they seem to think it's effective. And it it is. Voting matters. It changes things in um, game shows or in real life. Your little action in terms of carbon dioxide can also matter in the same way. They all add up. Uh, Seth, we mentioned you studied climate change mitigation. Personally, what changes have you made? You know what? I've been lucky enough to live in areas where public transit and biking are really easy, and I've always enjoyed and benefited from those. But diet was one thing that I really had to stop and look in and examine how I ate. I used to eat a lot of meat, and so I have given that up for the most part. Now, if a friend of mine is about to throw out his last half of a hot dog. I'm not going to let that food go to waste because I still really enjoy that taste and I'll try it out. But um, for the most part, I've switched over and I've enjoyed it. I I feel healthier. And I think a lot of these changes have so many co-benefits that you can enjoy making them without uh, even thinking too much about the climate. And so for our listeners, you know, in the new year, they often think of resolutions uh, to change uh, the way they are living. Uh, What's your suggestion to them, Seth, of where they could begin? You know, I would take a look at their own life, consider some of these high impact actions and try and take a first step in the easiest direction. So we're talking about avoiding air travel, living car free, eating a plant based diet. If for you, that means starting with greatly reducing your meat or even starting with a meatless Monday, take that first step, learn a new recipe and see if you can enjoy it. I should mention uh, Carmen Baskoff, who produced today's show, uh, she takes the train every day to and from work. So that's her contribution, she says. (laughs) Yeah, good for Carmen. Well, I want to thank again Seth Wines, who's a Ph.D. candidate at University of British Columbia. We'll tweet out links uh, to your research paper, Seth. Uh, He studies climate change mitigation, and we appreciate your time. Oh, thank you so much for having me on the show. As I mentioned, today's show produced by Carmen Baskoff. Special thanks to technical producer Kion Wolf and senior producer Lydia Brown. Learn more about the show at wmpr.org slash where we live. I'm Lucy Nopithanchel. As always, thanks for listening.